improbable victory obtained by default. Achievement made possible by the misfortune of others. According to the Macquarie Dictionary, this is what it means to do a Bradbury. <laughs> what the Macquarie Dictionary doesn't tell you though, is that throughout his career, training five hours a day, six days a week for 12 years, Stephen Bradbury is a four-time Winter Olympian and bronze medalist. He also won gold, silver and bronze at three separate world championships in his chosen sport of speed skating. So Steve, thank you and welcome for, to Central Queensland. Um, no worries, thank you for having me and uh, yeah. I love the, the intro with the doing a Bradbury thing. <laughs> Every time somebody says that it kind of makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up a little bit. I'm, I'm quite proud of that saying. Oh, I think it's amazing. and. What people don't realise is how much work you put into getting to that mm. point. So well, you know what like they most people actually do. Everyone else assumes that there was no backstory go into yeah, it, yeah. but I, most people say that and think, yeah, there must have been a lot of backstory because you don't wind up in the final at the Olympic Games because you're average at what you do. Yeah, no, well that's exactly mm. right. And Steve, so you grew up obviously in Australia, the home of summer sports. Why <laughs> did you choose ice? Yeah, it's certainly not the, the most Australian pastime. And I got started in the sport through my dad. He was the, the national champion a couple of times in the, in the 60s and he introduced me to it when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I developed a passion for. And, and once I somewhat controversially made it onto the Australian national team when I was 15, uh, I watched a, a Japanese skater. His last name was Kawasaki, same as the uh, motorbike. Yep, yep. And uh, he passed three guys on the outside and he broke the world record in the 1,000 metres by 0.8 of a second. And uh, I was the reserve, 15 years of age, sitting in the grandstand in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. in Holland. And I thought, I want to do that. And that was where I knew from that point that I was going to the Olympics. It was just a matter of where I was going to finish. How much support do Winter Olympians get from the Australian Olympic Committee compared to you know those Olympians involved with some, the summer sports? Yeah, well, a lot of people ask that and you know kind of think that the Winter Games is in a minority basket compared to the Summer Olympians, and that's not necessarily the case. I mean, there's a few high-profile sports in the Summer Olympics that are reasonably well funded. Mm -hmm. But you know, there's a lot of very low profile sports in the summer games that we don't see on the television aside from when the Olympics are on too. Yeah. So they all do it just as tough as, as the Winter Olympians. And you know, where I did it extremely tough. You know, you should have seen the sponsors lining up for a speed skater from Brisbane. Yeah, yeah, oh, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> they would have been few and far yeah, there, between. There, there wasn't, like it, there wasn't any. Yeah. But you know, I was, I was doing it on a shoestring like, yeah. The majority of our Olympians in 2019 are still doing it on a shoestring. Yeah. And that's where we're falling behind the rest of the world a little bit because other countries are often now specialising where they're pushing all of their funding into particular sports where they can win the most medals in. Mm -hmm. And we're still sp spreading our small budget pool thinly across all the sports and athletes in other countries are getting paid a salary mm. to train. Yeah. So, and you don't? No, in yeah. Australia our, our Olympians are still not getting paid mm -hmm. and sport now is, it's not just training in the morning and training in the afternoon like it used to be when I was in it. In between that, you've got your video analysis, your ice baths, your massage, your stretching, your nutrition and all these other things that fill up the day and then you go to training again in the afternoon mm -hmm. and all these things are very expensive. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have all these one percenters to get to the top. Yeah. and without proper funding that's you know i think a big part of the reason why we're steadily dropping down the olympic medal tally since sydney 2000 and you know i think it depends how much national importance do australians put on us doing well at the olympic games yeah I think we put a pretty high importance on that yeah, and we're not yeah. funding well, that we're, accordingly. We're a sport loving country aren't we? We are. Steve how fast do you go uh, on the ice? Uh, not that fast now. But, uh, <laughs> well, how, well, I'll rephrase that. How fast is an Olympic? Yeah, I, I used to be able to skate at about 54 kilometres an hour. That's fast because I did a bit of research because I wanted to ask that question. Um, but So I wanted to find out how fast a horse, a thoroughbred horse went. So a thoroughbred horse averages 60 kilometres an hour. So you're not very far behind a horse. Yeah, speed skating is 
actually the fastest self-propelled sport in the world, mm. meaning you don't have a horse to push you along, you don't yeah. have gravity, you're not going down a hill, or you don't have an engine. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's amazing. And it's pretty fast when you, uh, when you fall and you hit the barrier oh, at 50 yeah. k's and you stop. <laughs> so I wanted, that was going to be my next question because you've suffered injuries. One of the most notable was when you were impaled on the blade of another fellow's skate. You stopped yourself from losing consciousness on the ice. How did you do that? Because you lost a huge amount of blood. Yeah, well, that was, for me, possibly the most defining minute of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I learned the crazy amount of power that humans have inside themselves when put in a real life and death situation. And I was lying, around, lying there on the ice and I could see the amount of blood that was around me I lost three quarters of my blood in 60 seconds. And I could feel my body was all in shock. My eyes were closing and I thought, if I lose consciousness, I'm dead. And I just made a deal with myself there and then that losing consciousness wasn't an option. I got a lot of unfinished business to take care of in this life. And I'm just simply not gonna lose consciousness. Mm. And I'm a pretty positive guy. Yeah. And I was able to use that after I came back to the sport in a positive direction mm -hmm. because I think no matter how bad the day is, even if you're lying on the ice and you're about to die, it's you have to keep this thing here on positive all the time, no matter what. Even if it's the worst day, you just remain positive because positive energy takes you far. Yeah. And I used that in, in the sport when I came back if I was having a tough day in training and it felt like it too hard, felt like it was too hard, I tried to compare that to when I was lying on the ice with three quarters of my blood around me, and well, it wasn't really that tough a day anymore. And um, it's amazing the power that you open up within yourself, I suppose, and and that you don't realise you have until you're faced with something like a life-threatening situation like that. Yeah, and I wish I could draw that sort of power every day in everything yeah. I do, yeah. because if I did. I'd never get beaten at anything. But <laughs> yeah. unfortunately, I, I can't draw on that all yeah. the time. Yeah. And it's, it's something that I think incredibly successful people in the world are able to draw upon more often than others. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas most of us kind of get stuck in routine for too long and we go through the motions and then we have a period of time where we get our shit together and we, and we go hard at something. Yeah. And then we kind of get stuck in routine again and, yeah. you know. The next major injury you had, you were training and broke your neck. How do you psychologically overcome those serious traumas and get put your skates back on and get back on the ice? And I, I think that can be related back to life in general. When something happens, how do you get back out there? Yeah, we, anyone who succeeds in anything has difficult times along their journey, you know, and that's what that's what makes it is the journey if yeah. if success comes along easy you're uh, you know you're given a huge inheritance as a kid and mm. you know you can go and buy a ferrari for your 16th birthday because you've been given millions of dollars well the ferrari doesn't really mean much to you yeah but you know for me as a speed skater i'd been i'd been put through the ringer and i'd been training my guts out for most of my life and you know when it came around to the broken neck that was only 18 months before the gold medal and you know a lot of people around me said that was time to finish the doctor told me i'd never skate again and i just went to another doctor mm. was, in my head i had no choice i'd i had one more chance at the olympics mm. a fourth one in 16 months after the halo brace was deassembled and mm. unscrewed from my head yeah. and 14 months out of sorry 16 months out of 14 years in my head wasn't a very long time mm -hmm. so to finish there when i had one more shot at the big stage the olympics where the whole world finally decides to have a look at what a speed skater from brisbane's doing yeah if i don't have that one last shot i'm going to kick myself for the rest of my life so yeah. it's it's easy to it's easy to stop something if you haven't been doing it for that long and you haven't invested that much there's not much to lose but you know, for me, I'd done three Olympics. I hadn't done my best at any of them. I've been training my guts out for 12 years to not do the last 16 months. Not an option. Was there a little bit of fear, though, when you first 
got back on the ice after both of those traumas? Uh, when I got my leg cut open, I was only 21. I was fearless. 26 when I broke my neck. That was a that was a different conundrum, and you know I had a little bit of fear in the in the system. Yeah. And it came down to what I said before, being the unfinished business. Yeah. You know, and I kind of weighed it up as well. The chances of me crashing my car on the way to training at the ice rink and dying in a car crash are probably greater than going headfirst into the barrier again and becoming a paraplegic. Yeah. So, so you have let's to put- just look at it realistically, which is something I've always been pretty good at. Yeah. You know, and if you focus on what might happen, you're never going to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you get things in perspective I mean, too, I guess. And, and you have to be prepared to take a risk yeah. in life. If you're not prepared to put yourself out there, then you don't find out where the really good stuff is yeah. because you've got to get to an elite level at something before you start to uncover the the real adrenaline that is inside of competing in speed skating at a high level or running a multi-level a multinational company or you know being a successful farmer or coal miner or whatever it is until you put in all the groundwork you don't uncover the you don't uncover the real guts of it mm. Steve what was going through your mind during that race because you weren't considered a medal contender were you oh, I was past it by yeah. that point that was that was my fourth Olympics and I was the, I was the favorite to win that event eight years earlier and I got taken out in the first round at that Olympics and the guy who knocked me down got disqualified but that left me sitting there in the ice thinking this is bullshit. Yeah. And fast forward eight years to Salt Lake City and you know, I'm I'm hanging on for one last shot at it and I'm there for different reasons. I'm not there for medals, I'm there to to skate my best. That's and, interesting because uh, it comes down to a personal choice then and not um, that climatic sensation of winning that medal and and because anybody who what, we ride horses and compete with horses, so we're riding to win. But you were there for completely different reasons. Yeah, well, the, the change of mindset happened for me when, when I broke my neck and I had yeah. a couple of months in the halo brace. I had all that time to think about it. And up until there, through the first three Olympic Games that I'd competed at, it was all about the gold medal. Yeah, I was focusing on the outcome all the time. And whilst you need to have goals in what you do, yeah. I was probably a little bit too preoccupied with the gold medal at the end, you know, and okay. after the, the couple of months in the neck brace, I, I broke it all down and I said, well, I'm doing that last 16 months. I'm skating at the next Olympics. I know this, mm. but when I get there, I don't have a realistic chance of winning a gold medal anymore. Mm-hmm. So it can't be about that. Mm-hmm. So I broke it all the way back down to the, to the process. And I said, all right, I'm gonna arm myself with the best people that I can around me on the tiny little budget that I have as a speed skater from Brisbane yeah. and do my best every single day for that 16 months, put myself, in, put myself in position to have something really good happen at Salt Lake City and hopefully skate my best. Mm-hmm. And if I do that, and I don't care where I finish anymore. Yeah. And as it turned out, I did my best in the, in the earlier rounds of the competition and, and I beat a four-time world champion from Canada named Mark Gagnon. I'd beaten that prick for eight years prior to that night. Mm-hmm. And they didn't really show yeah. that race on the TV. And he, he's not a prick, he's a good bloke. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, a friend yeah. of mine. Yeah. But as it turned out in the end, my best in getting through the quarters into the semifinals ended up being good enough for a gold medal too. So when you got behind, so far behind in that race, what was going through your head? Do you remember? I was disappointed in the last couple of laps because in, in speed skating you, you race four races in about an hour and a half, two hours, heats, quarterfinals, semifinals, final. I've only got about 25 minutes rest in between races. So in my fourth Olympics, oldest skater, not just in the final, oldest in the entire Olympic field, mm-hmm. four races in an hour and a half was, that was a bit too much for me. You know, I didn't quite have the lactic acid tolerance yeah. to back up that many times in one night. Bring me back the next day, different story. Yeah. But that's not how the sport works. So dropping off the pace was something that I just, that just simply didn't happen. Yeah. You know, and to have that happen in the final, to skate 
the worst race I skated in the entire Olympics because I was tired from the yeah. other three rounds. Yeah. And I was like, oh, come on, where's my legs? Well, you know, yeah. this, is, this, is, this is way below what I can do. Yeah. But the strategy going into the final, you know, which I'd already spoken to my coach about prior was to, uh, to stay out of the way and hope for a mistake because mm. really we both knew that I wasn't going to have the legs to back it up and I knew it because I'd had the experience and judgment. So yeah. dropping off the pace didn't really change our plan because we were hoping for mistakes in front. Mm -hmm. And before the race, we honestly felt that there was a good chance of me getting a bronze mm -hmm. through other people's mistakes. Yeah. We never imagined it would be a silver or, you know, it was mm -hmm. completely unrealistic to think yeah. that I might win with that strategy. But, you know, when I saw the the Chinese guy, he, he fell first and I thought, well, that's heading into the last corner. That moves me up to fourth. That's, you know, here nor there, fourth or fifth. And then I saw out of the corner of my eye, the rest of them went down and I knew that all I had to do was glide across the line from there. I didn't have to skate. And I knew I was crossing the line first and I didn't, wasn't sure if I should celebrate or hide. Oh, no. I think <laughs> uh, every single Australian, I'm sure, like me, had goosebumps watching that race and, and seeing you come over the line and put your arms up. It was just magical. Steve, you're a motivational speaker now. You speak professionally. Um, what life lessons do you impart to your audience? Yeah, the old, the most uh, important ones. The old motivational speaker cliche. I, I don't. I, it still doesn't sit well with me when someone says that you're yeah. a motivational speaker. Yeah, okay. kind of sounds. I don't know, a bit wanky, a bit American <laughs> somehow. But uh, I prefer real life speaker. Yeah, okay. You know, and I've got a fair bit of real life context in things that I've done. Yeah. And well, that's what makes you good at what. Yeah. What I, you do because I, people believe because you know, you've been there. I think the lessons in from my life and the ones that I try and project upon an audience is firstly that you need to have a plan. You know, a lot of people have things they want to achieve in their life, but they're stuck in their head. Mm -hmm. They need to get down on paper so you can refer back to the plan and check how you're tracking towards it. Write down all the little things that you need to do to get from your short-term goal to your medium-term goal to your long-term goal. That's called a to-do list, mm -hmm. not optional. Mm -hmm. You don't do that. You just leave it in here, you lose most of it in a couple of weeks. People forget shit real quick. Yeah. So you gotta write it down. And from there, you start to put in the hard yards and hopefully you get to, a point, to get to a point where you go from being a little bit of a beginner at what you do and you start to push towards elite mm -hmm. at what you're doing. Mm. You start to do those ideas that you wrote down on your to-do list, you've put a bunch of them into practice now. Yep. And you've stacked, I call them the one percenters. Mm -hmm. You stack them up on top of each other, the one percenters, you start to get towards that elite level and then you start to uncover the adrenaline that's hidden, mm -hmm. that people that haven't done those one percenters don't know about. Mm. And you get that, doesn't feel like work anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Then, you're, then you're hooked and you're in. Yeah, right. On. And you, you hopefully keep pushing to become towards the best in the world at something. And then the other piece of the puzzle you need to add if you want to get to being the best at what you do is to add the team around you. Mm. Have a good bullshit filter so the people that are the pretenders that come along and tell you how to do it that don't really know what they're talking about, humour them mm. in one ear out the other. But then you've got to go and find the people who actually can help you because generally they won't come looking for you. Mm. You've got to go looking for them. Yeah. The people that have got the real knowledge and the real skill to help. Yeah. And if you can get that right support network around you and maybe not make the mistakes that the more experienced people did, mm. learn by other people's mistakes and not making them yourself, then yeah. you're ahead of the game. It's funny how, you know, what you have achieved can relate back to it relates back to real life and how people can live their lives day to day doesn't it really with goal setting and yeah well being positive all the time yeah. you know having a positive mindset is is a big part of it we all know yeah. we all know negative people that come along and say and tell you know people that have a nice house and a nice car that they're lucky yeah 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 Ah, oh, really? Yeah. They're lucky. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, they're the, they're generally the people that they're not doing a real lot. No, exactly. You know, yeah. and, and they never will. Yeah. 
So Steve, Last Man Standing, your book. You wrote a book about your experiences. And um, I did. I've got a couple inside. I'll give one to you. I would you love one, one because yeah. I tried to get one online. and um, Yeah, we did that a few years ago now. It's a, yeah, 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 no, I'd love to read it. Um, but there's a movie in the wind. There is. Tell me about yeah, that. Yeah, the, uh, well, the title, the producers and the director have come, that they think they're sticking with now is just simply Bradbury. Right, okay. Yeah, so the script has been yep. written. Uh, Stuart, so Stuart Beatty is the, the guy who wrote the script and he did Pirates of the Caribbean, Collateral, oh, yeah. Collateral and lots of other well-known movies. Yep. And yeah, we're, we're planning on filming in Queensland. Yep. And hopefully hitting the cinema just prior to the next Winter Olympics, which is around January 2022, so about that's, two and a half years away. That's awesome. And mm. will you have much of an input into the production? Yeah, I'm already heavily involved with it. And, yep. You know, the the company that's got the rights to make it wants me involved as much as I want to be involved, and yep. they want to keep it as true to the real story as what they can. That's really You know, good. they'll need to move a few things around in the timeline and, yep. you know, try and squash 14 years into two and a two half hours, hours yep. or two hours or however long the movie is, yep. you know, and, and make it entertaining for an audience, but that's their job, and, yep. you know, they want me to to be the guy to keep it as authentic as possible. I'm sure it will be entertaining. Who's going to play you? Ah, that's a... Secret. That's to be continued. Ah, but, okay. Uh, yeah, there's a market for it on Sportsbet. Oh, really? Apparently, okay. yeah. If you want to if you want to bet on uh, the favourite is Liam Hemsworth. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't bet on him. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a bit of... That's insider knowledge. We could yeah. go to jail for that, could we? <laughs> um, now, I... During my research, I came across a really great... It's concise documentary about you, Olympics on Record. And um, it has some great historical footage. I don't know. Have you ever seen it? Mm, I'm not sure. I don't think it, so. It's really good. It goes for about six minutes. Um, but it has footage going, you know, throughout your whole career when you had hair. <laughs> you, had, you used to skate with a long ponytail. Yeah, well, I've still got some hair. <laughs> getting back a little bit now. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much, Stephen, for taking your time and for coming up and visiting us in Central Queensland. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, thanks for having me. Thank See you. you. Later. Thanks so much for watching our video. I hope you enjoyed it. And please try to remember to just click on the subscribe button so we can keep you updated with everything that's happening. Thank you.